welcome to the Theology Podcast. We're really glad to have you with us for this episode. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor and I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest, although I'm in Connecticut today. So we're all in the same time zone, uh, although uh, many people believe that Indiana is in the central time zone, but it's not, except like the part right up close to Chicago. Anyway, there's probably another part of the state too. I'm just guessing, but... The, the part 15 minutes west of me. Yeah, that's right. So you're like on the very edge. You're like the last person, you know, in in the eastern time zone before you get into the central time zone. Anyway, uh, enough about me. Why don't we kick it over to you, Tom? I'm Tom Price. I teach systematic theology and Christian ethics. Uh, I teach both at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and other places. <laughs> Okay, well, we've got a timely topic today, and Glenn is the one who's kind of lead the charge. So, uh, Glenn, introduce yourself, and then the topic, and then let's get into it. I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a retired history professor, senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, Ministry Associated Reflections Ministries, and I do a few other things, too. Um, what we're going to talk about today is the Israel-Palestine conflict. But I don't want to get into the politics of this. I think there are some other issues that are really important that we need to be thinking about, particularly related to the conduct of the war. So let, but I think it might be helpful to start off with a quick summary of the history of where Israel, modern Israel is coming from. Um, it, this really starts in the 19th century with something that Jewish thinkers referred to as the Jewish question which is how do the Jews live in the middle of gen the Gentiles in a hostile world? What should they do? How should they, uh, how should they handle this? One of the solutions that they came up with was Zionism, the idea that maybe they should move back to the historic land of Israel and reestablish a state there, or at least live under the British mandate or something where they can live in peace, in theory at least. By the way, when uh, when the Nazis come up with the idea of the final solution, that's the final solution to the Jewish question. Right. That is, that is literally what they were responding to. Right. Well, um, in the early 20th century, we have this um, event known as World War I. And there was a large Jewish population living in Germany. So during the war, Britain issued a thing called the Balfour Declaration, which stated that in the uh, that that the Jews should have the right to return and to a state in historic Israel, um, part of the British mandate uh, at that point. Now they did this really not so much because they were concerned about the Jews, but because it was propaganda. Uh, what they were trying to do is create questions or dissension or disloyalty within Germany, their enemy during the war. If the Jews started to say, hey, if England wins, we get a state, uh, this could undermine the German war effort. That's why they did it, really. Um, after the war, we can see that uh, the British do absolutely nothing to establish a Jewish state. All through this time, though, there were Jews who were emigrating to the area of modern Israel. You know, there were Jews who were moving in. Now, there were other people there, too. There were Muslims, there were Christians, um, and so on. So we've got, we've got a, a mixed population there. When World War II hits, um, with the Holocaust, the European powers, the, well, the Allied powers, the winners in the war, were so horrified at what was done to the Jews that they, together with the United Nations, mandated that the territory in Palestine or the, the Levant, this, this region, should be divided into two states, a Jewish state and a non-Jewish state called a Palestinian state. The problem is the Arabs were completely unwilling to accept this idea of a partition. And as a result, the, it, when Israel was born, it immediately was attacked on all sides by the Arabs. Somehow it managed to survive even with absolutely minimal 
uh, military uh, equipment. Uh, there have since been several wars that have been initiated against Israel. Uh, in each case, Israel has won and frequently has expanded its territory uh, during these wars. Um, the first breakthrough occurs with a, a peace treaty with Egypt, where Israel returns the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt, and Egypt agrees to uh, be at peace with Israel. Um, the Israelis were encouraged to try to set up a Palestinian state. And so they ceded control of the West Bank and Gaza to the Palestinians as a, um, basically as a test to see if a two-state solution would be possible. The Palestinians in Gaza promptly elected Hamas as their government. Hamas is an organization whose explicit stated objective is the complete destruction of Israel and quite likely the genocide of the Jews, depending on how you read the document. Um, Hamas immediately suppressed all other political parties. They assassinated rivals. They did all of those kinds of things. And they turned Gaza into a, a center for terrorist strikes against Israel. The West Bank had an election that probably was crooked. Um, and with the backing, I suspect, of both Israel and the United States, Fatah, uh, formerly the, uh, the PLO, uh, got control of the West Bank. They have also not held any free or fair elections since. They've been holding on to power there. Now, they're since Fatah is a um, moderate, relatively moderate Palestinian organization, um, and Israel and the U.S. sort of back them not much, not because they like them much exactly, but because they're the best of, of a bunch of bad alternatives. The other thing that is worth noting is that currently, uh, according to surveys done by Arab sociologists, two thirds of the people in Gaza support Hamas. Um, and about the same number want Israel destroyed uh, and are leaning toward genocide against the Jews. In the West Bank, where Fatah is in control, 58% of the population support Hamas and its goals. So this creates a situation where a two-state solution is extraordinarily difficult when the majority of people on the other side don't want you to exist if you're an Israeli. Okay. So that's the situation. Now, Israel, for its part, um, it needs to be said they have, they have not been gentle with the Palestinians. Um, they're, they're, you know, by... A lot of human rights standards, there's a lot to criticize in Israel. That said, Arabs, both Christian and Muslims, live at peace inside the borders of Israel and even have representation in the government. The same cannot be said for uh, the Palestinian territories. Now, the, the thorny issue ends up being the, the so-called right of return. That is to say, when the Palestinians were displaced from their homes when the Israeli state was created, and there are questions about exactly what happened there. But when that occurred, do the Palestinians have a right to come back? And if they do, functionally, what we're saying is that Israel as a Jewish state should no longer exist because they will, the population of the returning Palestinians will overwhelm the Jewish population, and giving their attitudes toward the Jews, it will probably result in mass slaughter. I mean, that, that's my read of the situation. But so Israel can't afford to allow the right of return. Uh, but that's one of the key Palestinian demands, along with a complete... Uh, uh, control of Jerusalem. They want Israel to completely withdraw from Jerusalem. So there are a number of other issues that we can deal with, you know, but in terms of the overall picture of what's going on, uh, that's what we're dealing with here. Yeah, a couple of observations just or thoughts. Uh, I'm by no means an authority on this part of the world. Uh, 
Uh, but I think there are things even a casual observer can note. Uh, one is that uh, the Israelis won uh, early conflicts with their neighbors uh, with almost um, no, you know, no help, uh, you know, in terms of being uh, outmanned, uh, outgunned, but they just kind of were better fighters and smarter. And of course, when you're fighting for your life, you do a lot of things uh, that, um, you know, you might not do if you were just an invader, you know, trying to, you know, go into someone else's territory. These, these are just casual observations. The other thing is that uh, in terms of uh, prosperity, economic prosperity, uh, we're talking about a part of the world where all of the neighbors, with the exception, I guess, of maybe Lebanon, um, really are basket cases. Um, now, but Lebanon is mainly because of civil war and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, you've got, I remember, I've got a number of Jewish friends and they're like, okay, yeah, we're the we're the chosen people, but we've got the only piece of real estate in the Middle East that doesn't have any oil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. so so what, what did they do that, you know, everybody else is, you know, uh, basically paying for their their uh, corrupt, you know, administrations with oil money. And some of that oil money, you know, trickles down to the population. Uh, and Israel is a place where there's high tech, you know, there's um, economic vibrancy, uh, entrepreneurship, that kind of stuff. So not only is it a, is it a politically more open place. Now you know you know, you made some comments, Glenn, that I think are probably right about you know things not being as you know uh, fair as maybe they could be. But again, you know we're outsiders; we're not looking at a place that's in constant you know turmoil. Right. Yeah. Now the, it's. Within Israel, I would say things are really good. The question is the Israeli treatment of the Palestinians. Right. And But given that they're con they were doing bus bombings, they were doing all kinds yeah, yeah. of things, they're firing rockets constantly, you, you, how do you defend yourself with this? You can't exactly treat the situation with kid gloves. I mean, right. so, I mean, I understand why the Israelis are doing what they're doing. Having said that, it probably does in some instances, go beyond what international norms would uh, consider acceptable. I mean, I think we have to admit that. Yeah. I was listening to a, a pastor who is at the oldest Protestant uh, church in Jerusalem, the Anglican church there, and uh, he was talking about that very fact that of course, Israel isn't innocent in all of its kind of ways of dealing with things, but there are a lot of things outsiders, like you said, um, don't understand. And one in particular is the bus bombing. They had congregation members who were hurt by collateral damage because of bus bombings, just trying to go to church, right? Um, and so the, 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 the suspicion and the protection of your children and your families is at the forefront of their psychology, not first and foremost what looks fair on paper. Um, that's, that's one thing. And then the second thing he uh, kind of uh, addressed was this current um, attack um, is really strongly instigated, in his view, from uh, Iranian interest with Hamas because of the close um, ties that Israel has made with Saudi Arabia, and that threatens their their agenda for, for total control of that area. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That, that seems very likely. Um, Saudi Arabia was very close to signing on to the Abraham Accords, um, and but this, this really did short-circuit that. Yeah, so I, think, I, I think that's a, a likely observation there. Yeah, I saw some some analysis uh, along that line too. I guess basically the Saudis had strong uh, confidence in Israel's uh, intelligence, and that really undermined it. Uh, that the Israelis didn't see this attack yeah. coming. Yeah, yeah. So, um, like I said, I, I'm not. I don't think we none of us are expert enough to try to really do a serious adjudication of all of the issues here. But I think what I've outlined now, obviously, I'm coming from a, um, uh, a 
more or less pro-Israel perspective here with recognition of, of some of the things that maybe might be questionable that they do. Um, but I think that this is sort of a fair picture overall of the situation. What, what, I'm, what I am interested in, however, is looking at this from sort of a bigger picture and looking at uh, what its relevance is for us in America right now. Um, and we can start here with the atrocities committed by Hamas in the latest attack. If you listen to the Jewish forensic scientists who are going through and trying to identify victims and things like that, it's very clear that uh, Hamas, number one, was targeting civilians, whatever they may say. Hamas claims they don't target civilians, but they also claim that no Israeli is a civilian. Well, there you they're, go. <laughs> they're all part of not the ba- power. Bachelor, bachelors right. are all unmarried men. <laughs> right. Is, yeah. Israelis are yeah. all part of the opposition force. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah they're yeah. all combatants. But what, what you see happening is really horrific atrocities where, you know, there's there's evidence of people having body parts chopped off before they are killed. Um, there's evidence of people being tied up and burned alive, um, you know, on and on and on. It is, a, a, um, in, and let alone the the rapes and things like that that happened. Um, this this is all well documented. And one of the things I won't tolerate is people telling me it didn't happen. Okay, I'll just I'll just say that if you're on social media with me, don't go there. Um, but. We're rightly horrified by these things, but we're rightly horrified in part because we've kind of forgotten history. The fact of the matter is this is more or less the way people have acted in war kind of forever. Um, The only time you don't do this is if you're conquering a territory and you need the population to work the land. Yeah, you, you brought this out in your breakpoint piece a bit, um, and you noted that the archae- archae- uh, the, ar- the archaeological evidence, say, for the Americas, uh, even, you know, I, I, one of the things, you know, I've, I've observed is that a downside to being Western civilization is we keep good records. Um, we've got lots of documentations of all the things we do. Uh, the Nazis were, like, almost insanely meticulous about keeping – good records of their atrocities so that when we walked in we could see everything yeah that's what happened they they documented it all yeah. but when when we talk about preliterate cultures or non-western cultures uh this these things happen uh as frequently if if not more but there are just no records and, you, and the only way you discover that these things happen is when you come you know, uncover the mass burial sites and stuff like that Yeah. And, you know, there are at least two of them that I know of in North America, one of them in Colorado, about 1200 years ago, where an entire village was massacred. And they were they were ethnically different, it appears, from the attackers. But the the attackers scalped the victims. You can see the marks on the skull. Uh, They actually. the way it was described, they they beat their feet to pulps, um, and just just incredible nastiness and brutality. Then you have the Crow Creek massacre, another one, uh, five hundred people killed, and they were just left left exposed. You know this because um, uh, animals were at the bodies, um, and someone later came and buried them. Evidently, you know, maybe a neighboring tribe or something like that. But you know, you get this in the Americas. But it's not unusual in, you know, in Africa. It's not unusual. If you look at Greek warfare, there was a lot of this kind of thing that ended up happening. Uh, the Romans certainly were experts at it, as were the Persians, the Mongols, uh, the Vikings. And Viking raids, this kind of thing would be common, including the carrying off of captives to be sold to slaves. Um, you know, uh, on and on and on. The first army in history that did not engage in this kind of behavior was the new model army under Cromwell during the English Civil War. There you go. 
Um, and that was an army, in order to be in that army, you had to give a, 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 a conversion testimony. Mm -hmm. You know, so they, they were very serious that they were fighting for God and they had to do it God's way. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. but that, that's the first army in history where that's true. And that's the mid 17th century. Yeah, I just picked up on an editorial in the Wall Street Journal here. Uh, it was published here on the 18th, um, entitled Dostoevsky Knew It Can Happen Here. And he's, uh, the author is Gary Saul Morrison. Uh, and he's uh, reflecting on some things that Dostoevsky wrote concerning this very phenomenon you're talking about. Um, basically, um, during his lifetime, there were these kinds of atrocities that were occurring yeah. um, on the boundary of the, you know, the Ottoman Empire, and um, people just flailed alive, and it, you know, it was just basically, uh, and then, and then uh, all of the apologists uh, on the in the Ru Russian intelligentsia for this kind of behavior, just like we see today. It, there's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's yeah. nothing new under the sun. The intelligentsia is, is always been um, more than happy, at least in the last few hundred years, to come to the, to the um, propaganda aid of whatever the favorite group is, and you know whether we're talking about communists or Nazis or whatever yeah. or Hamas. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's interesting you mentioned that. Um, the the uh yeah i knew i knew firsthand from some some folks whose families were survivors of the holocaust through the russians coming to deliver them but the way in which their families were treated by the russians who delivered them um the horrendous behavior of a lot of those soldiers towards them rape everything else was just on equally unfathomable so here you have both the ones that had put you in that kind of situation, the Nazis, and the ones that are actually delivering you, both treating you on this level of radical, radically inhuman. Um, and yeah, the apologists, or it just gets brushed aside. And, and But it does open up an interesting question is, what is it about the chaos of the brutality of war that uh, really allows for that kind of behavior to manifest itself so atrociously. Well, I, I think, Tom, though, we can say we, we, there's still distinctions we can make. If, like, if, if I were, uh, you know, being liberated by an, ar by an army, uh, the last yeah. army I want to be liberated by would be the, the Soviets. And the one that I'd want to be yeah, liberated yeah. by would be the Brits yeah. or the Americans. And we can actually see that yeah. in the attitudes of the people yeah. who were delivered by the Brits and the Americans. Yeah. Whew, so glad it was you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so, so let, let, let's take a step back, though. What is the difference? I would argue that there are two things that are at work here that we need to pay attention to. One of them, well, is the development of international law, which is beginning with people like Hugo Grotius um, in the Netherlands, uh, who's going to start working on developing a, an idea of international law, Suarez and a number of others. That international law incorporates in it laws of war. Those laws of war, in turn, are drawn from the second key point, Christian just war theory. And in fact, everything that we have in the laws of war really has its origin, if you trace it back, it ultimately comes from Augustine and Aquinas on war. Now, what that means is that while Christian civilization continues to hold a powerful moral sway in the West, even where it's lost its, its moorings in terms of the existence of God and things like that, while there is still this borrowed capital of ethical standards, we have a, 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 a hindrance to excessive brutality and warfare. You know, we don't, you know, atrocities occur. You know, there, there are war crimes that are committed, but they're recognized as war crimes. They're not celebrated. They're not trumpeted. They're nothing else. They're recognized as war crimes. As 
when you move outside of realms in which there is this respect for international law and this Christian ethical tradition, the older, more brutal forms of warfare um, are going to reemerge. You know, Clausewitz uh, distinguished between true war and real war. Um, if I remember which one is which, true war is what happens when armies in uniform uh, fight each other in sort of set-piece battles and, and things like that. Real war is what the Cossacks and these other guys on the margins do, which include raids, it includes yeah. uh, plunder, it includes rape, all of those kinds of things. Clausewitz recognized that. And in the context of European society, the tendency was to go toward the more formal warfare. That is what they wanted to see because it minimized the damage to everything else. Now, again, atrocities or war crimes happen, but it tends to be minimized in those contexts. Move to the Soviet Union. They explicitly get rid of Judeo-Christian ethics. What happens yeah. in terms of how they conduct war? You don't want to be liberated by the Russians. Yeah. Hamas in the yeah. Muslim <laughs> world explicitly rejects that. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm completely on on uh, point with you there, Glenn. Uh, some some nuances, though, some things that occur to me as you know we're talking about this. Uh, one of those things is the uh, the self sort of critical attitude of Western civilization that can't uh, sort of admit that we have some basis for, st for stating that even though there have been things that have been done in the course of Western civilization that are uh, very sinful, nevertheless, relatively speaking, it's the best of the options. There's this unwillingness on the part particularly of of, of those who despise the Christian faith to give any um, consideration for that. I also think, yeah. though, too, that yeah. one of the reasons why the West has succeeded, uh, and it ties into this, and why there's so much more, I guess, animosity toward it, uh, is the fact that because of its technical achievements, you know, uh, Western uh, military might has been pretty hard to resist. Yeah. Um, on the first point, it's worth noting that that is a consequence of Christianity. Because Christ it is Christianity that gives Western civilization, uniquely of any world civilization, the ability to criticize itself, to critique itself. Now, you had, you had some Romans who would criticize Roman society and so on. Um, and you do find, you know, you find social critics everywhere. But the, uh, the, the notion that there can be a widespread critique of society is based on the premise of human depravity. It's based on the premise of original sin. Now, where it goes wrong is they view original sin as only existing and uniquely existing in Western society. So we can't admit anything good here while we ignore the crimes of other cultures uh, the depravity of other cultures and puff up their their positive uh, achievements. Right. So, yeah, I think that we often see, especially in that that kind of self critical aspect of the West, is when it gets radicalized, like we see with the increasing um, volume of the left, um, is they basically think that the good things that they way Western culture over against the kind of the moral measure is itself a byproduct of it. So the, the very measure they hold the West up to, it wouldn't have even been there had it not been for the impact of Judeo-Christianity in particular and, and uh, Christianity even more particularly. But then also you, you have the, the left start to see itself as having the moral high ground by associating itself with what it considers to be all the victims of Western society and its its power. And so you, you have voices now, for example, who th they only see Israel through the lens of the paradigm of, you know, Western power and colonialization. 
and see themselves as basically defending the underdog, which again would have been a Western contribution of Christianity, right? The one that's exploited is is and, and the like, even if they get the interpretation wrong, which I believe they do. Um, but when, what ends up happening is they begin to set the table for the legitimacy of those barbaric forms of of war or attack, um, all in the name that these people are desperate against, you know, asymmetrical power, and therefore they're acting out of sheer desperation. So they utilize, again, as Nietzsche would say, the Christian resources to basically undermine Christian ways of dealing with these things, and then they set the conditions for barbarism to spread more widely, all in the name of justice. Yeah, there's right. a kind of there's a kind of naivete concerning um, non-Western cultures, uh, and I'm not sure if naivete is the right term. I, I think there's almost a willful blindness, or even in sort of willful st- yeah. stupidity, uh, they just don't want to admit that th- things that they do know are true are true. I'm reminded too, getting back to Dostoevsky, was it his book Demons, where he talks about um, basically uh, the, the the moral bankruptcy of the intelligentsia before the the Bolshevik Revolution um, in that part of the world, where you had a lot of these. Um, well, the same thing you see in our society. You know, what, what we have today is um, Ivy League students who've mm-hmm. enjoyed. Uh, more opportunity with less gratitude than perhaps any group of people in the history of the world. <laughs> and and yeah. every opportunity that they get to align themselves with um, really barbaric uh, movements like Hamas, they do it. Okay. Now, he- here's what's going on here. Um, you know, Tom, I think you hit, hit the nail on the head. Uh, within critical theory, which is what really dominates the academy now, and um, and pretty much the elites everywhere, you have a um, you have a dehumanization that takes place, sort of systematically. Anybody is simply you, you are not an individual. The individual has has really no value in this system. You're a representative of a class. You're representative of a race. You're representative of a fill in the blank. And if you, in every one of these categories, there are people who are oppressors and people who are oppressed. If you're an oppressor, you're evil. If you're oppressed, you're good. And so they've got a laundry list of oppressed groups that they all feel solidarity with. Thus, you get gays for Palestine. Yeah, it they, is. <laughs> I mean, because, because as far as they're concerned, it's solidarity among all the oppressed peoples. Of course the Palestinians yeah. will accept us because they think exactly like we do. No, they don't. Yeah. But <laughs> once, once you eliminate <laughs> the, the value of the individual and only assign people to groups, you automatically give yourself permission to dehumanize them. And if they're oppressors, you can especially do this. Thus, in decolonization, yeah. which is now one of the big words in critical theory at the moment – Decolonization says that the colonized, the oppressed people, have every right to rise up and do anything necessary or, frankly, anything they want to the oppressors to take back power and to take back their proper place and to drive out the colonialists. Thus, Hamas is perfectly justified in going and torturing and killing and raping and everything else, Israelis, and slaughtering 1,400 of them, unarmed civilians mostly, because that's what decolonization is about. That is the oppressed colonial peoples rising up. And you have people expressly advocating for that in the United States, also, by the way, describing America as a colonial power. Yeah. Sure. Sooner or later, we got to take these people at their word. Yeah, and I, I think that um, when we think about, say, the various responses to this, we have, I think, people who, for whatever reason they uh, have, you know, in mind, uh, are are apologists and are, I guess, uh, trying to keep. Um, 
maybe the left coalition together, if you get my drift. So, you know, I've known people on the left that I disagree with about a great number of things, but I've also known them to be reasonable, relatively reasonable people that we you can work with. Mm-hmm. At the same time, uh, I they're very honorable. Yeah. And yeah, there are some, honorable people yeah. on the left. But at the same time, some of them um, are very reluctant to ever punch left, you know, as the saying goes. Uh, so they'll, you know, maybe in private over coffee say, yeah, you got a point there. These guys are kind of nuts. But uh, <laughs> they would never say anything like that in public. You know, now we have the same problem on the right. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think it's worse on the left. Frankly, I, I do. Um, and I guess the, another thing is, is, is that there's in the muddled middle of American society, um, I think a lot of people find this stuff very distasteful, but they're afraid to say anything. I also think that they tend to give uh, people too much credit um, and they'll you know, say, well, we just need to be understanding. No, no, you don't. I mean, these people are, are, are willfully, knowledgeably um, choosing not things that are merely absurd, but evil uh, to support. And so anyway... Yeah, you know, you see this, uh, you know, as you pointed out at places like Harvard. Um, and what's mm-hmm. really striking is the mealy-mouthed response from from the... I guess, the, uh, that's, I guess that's what I'm getting at, the administration, yeah. you know. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, it, now, unfortunately for them, a lot of their donors are paying attention. And there, there yeah. are people who are major donors who are on boards of trustees and things like that who are resigning over what's going on, um, which I think is a positive thing. But in a lot of ways, it's too little too late. I mean, they should really have been paying attention to this stuff as it was building. Yeah. You know, if, well, that, yeah, well, they, they gave, they gave, you know, they basically set conditions up to give rise to the loudmouth beasts on the left and the student rebels and everything else. And so they're cowards when it turns back around to after, after, afterwards shut up half of what they helped create i mean i know i'm on the universities i know what's there and uh and you know you all know as well and they appease and appease and they give the platform to but to the point they were shutting down all anything that the left was uncomfortable with right so they've been continuously catered to and emboldened and so now they're fearful of what could happen if they actually take a stand to say, you know what, you people are really being idiots and barbaric. <laughs> I wonder too if there's if there isn't even a, a family dynamic. I mean, in the in the literal sense of family, um, yeah. you'll have on the left in progressive households, um, you know, people who. Uh, and this is dating me, obviously, but, you know, grew up in the Great Depression and were supporters of FDR and, you know, the New Deal. And then they had kids who were on kind of the new left uh, who were, you know, part of the, you know, Weather Underground and, you know, 1968 and stuff like that. And then those yeah. people had kids. Yeah. And now those kids, yeah. um, you know, each generation seems to be less in touch with reality. <laughs> and so now yeah. you get yeah. – uh, and I, and I wonder how much of this is covering for the kids. I've seen this in even yeah. in uh, the, the the Christian world, where um, yeah. you know you'll have fairly uh, sound um, and up, up you know upright uh, Christian leaders who have kids who are kind of wacky. And you know, give me an example. I mean yeah. Charles Stanley and his son Andy. Yeah, I mean, yep. and yeah. Andy, would Andy Stanley have anything like the platform he has if he hadn't had a father named Charles who was, you know, mm-hmm. uh, pastor of the large church in Atlanta? No way. I mean, yeah, he might have been a popular pastor, but he wouldn't have the, the kind of reach that North Point has and the book deals that he's got. And now yeah. and now he's he's de- he's demonstrating that he's if, if he's not a Marcionite, he's he's flirting with it. <laughs> <laughs> and and no one has condemned him, yeah. as far as I can see, in in terms of mainstream evangelical. <laughs> there are people on the, you know, who didn't like him to begin with, who say, "Well, look what's going on over here." But I, I guess well, these are parallel phenomena. Is what I'm saying. I don't want to get yeah. into the Andy, Andy Stanley yeah. thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, the 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 thing that I found really really striking 
Um, I went to the University of Wisconsin. It's where I got my doctorate. There were demonstrations outside the library. I know exactly where it was. I've stood in that spot. You know, I've walked through that area all the time. Demonstrations in the library actively supporting and cheering Hamas's actions in Israel and actively calling for the genocide against the Jews. It's really what it comes down to. And there are these Jewish students there pleading with an administrator to say something, to do something, and he just ignored them. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, if you were to say the N-word on that campus... Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. But, but it, getting, it, 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 take it a step further. If you even quoted a rap lyric as a white person that included the N-word, sure. you'd be sanctioned. And yet these are people who are explicitly threatening or advocating yeah. killing their fellow students. Now here, another wrinkle to this that's fascinating to me is that the mo one of the most implacable supporters of the left, generally speaking, in the United States has been secular Jews. Right. But even they are starting to wake up. I mean, they're, they're kind of getting to the place where they've had enough. I've have a number of Jewish friends. I grew up with Jewish friends. Uh, my literary agent is Jewish. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had conversations with them over the years about a range of things and we touch on this kind of stuff. But uh, it's as though, um, uh, well, basically, um, they took for granted their the sort of the security of their position on the left. And now they're they're kind of uh, wondering. It's been interesting to watch it. Uh, it's kind of a an existential crisis that many uh, Jews are, are going through. Right. Yeah. So then, then you have the students at Harvard who find these letters and people are saying, well, they're just kids. You can't take it seriously. You shouldn't hold it against them. They're law students. They're not right. kids. Right. Right. So, Go ahead, Tom. Tom. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the... Um, I think the point taken, you know, with the universities and their complicitness in it. But like you said, I, I have known similarly um, left-leaning Jewish folks. And a lot of times in conversation, they've said, look, we know what it's like to be, you know, our humanity to be left out. So we've kind of taken the step that would rather include more and more people and be on the side of the underdog when their humanity was not treated well than not. But they also are beginning to say, wait a minute the flip side of that is some of those who we've very much went out for in terms of defending their humanity and their right to exist are wiping us off the planet. Um, and there is no negotiation because in, in these situations we're dealing with, it's two absolute positions. You know, there isn't a room for compromise. It is wipe you out or, or nothing. Um, it isn't about, oh, let's work towards a peaceable solution so we all can flourish and, and maybe even benefit each other. There, there isn't room for that. And so that, that kind of open-mindedness that you could take for granted isn't applicable here. Would you like to establish a privatized banking system that will help you separate from the mainstream banks and get more control over your money? Join a growing community of families, business owners, pastors and churches, yes, even churches, that are learning to establish and manage a privatized banking system and enjoy the safety of guaranteed tax-free growth perpetuated by the amazing power of uninterrupted compound interest. Don't wait for the next crash. Contact Private Family Banking. They are here to help fuel the future of the family and the church with multi-generational wealth building. See our contact information in the show notes below or just email us at banking at privatefamilybanking.com. Returning to, you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the alliance between radical Islam and critical theory is one of these unstable things that I've seen really right from the start when I started working with critical theory, where you have feminists, where you have gays, uh, LGBTQ, all of that, uh, aligning themselves with the Islamists because they're both against some form of oppression as defined on the American left, that always struck me as an unstable combination. And we're, we're actually seeing that coming to roost here. I'm, I'm also, though, interested in getting back to the question of, of uh, what war looks like when you lose 
I mean, I've already made my statement on this. When you lose concepts of international law or when you don't respect it, the idea of international law, when you think you serve a higher law, when you devalue the individual and put them in groups so that that makes them easy to to attack and target. And then you eliminate Christian just war theory and Christian ethical stances from what war looks like. And what you get is exactly what we what we saw in Israel. The question that I have is that as the West has increasingly lost its moorings, which we've all, which we already saw a decade or so ago with Abu Ghraib uh, in America, um, as we are losing our moorings, are we going to be seeing war reverting to this, well, th- this historic pattern of, of uh, massive, just simply abusive of everybody in sight? Yeah, I, I think that's inevitable. Uh, I also wonder about the stability of nation states, uh, generally speaking, and what might follow. So, you know, when you think about what you have in the Middle East, you know, as an outsider, you look at the situation, and you just say, man, there's just like any given moment, something could set this off. There are these groups, there are these longstanding hostilities, there are these ethnic enclaves that you can strike from and return to. Um, that's not all that different than certain things we see, even in the United States, in certain regions, places where I think a very unsteady piece like California, uh, where you've got a lot of rhetoric, a lot of tension, a lot of uh, growing resentment between different groups. It could break out uh, if there were, say, a serious economic correction or downturn. I mean, I'm, I'm talking uh, not recession, I'm talking depression, you know, something like that. What, what would follow? Uh, because of basically the forces of stability are just that. I mean, they're, they're strictly speaking force would be because you've lost a common sense of identity. You've lost a common sense of moral sort of uh, standards to govern your interactions. With you. Obviously there are going to be saintly people in, in all sorts of places, uh, you know, but uh, like I remember when I was in Los Angeles before the riots in the early nineties, uh, you could feel it in the air. You know, I would walk through skid row, you uh, walk through different parts of Koreatown or whatever, and you could sense that there was something uh, very uh, unstable about that environment. That's what, you know, 30 years ago now. Um, and things are worse. Uh, but you could look at other parts of the United States, you know. I mean, think about Min- Minneapolis, for goodness sake. Right. If, if, if Minneapolis, I mean, I've always thought of, you know, that's like the, the land of nice. <laughs> <laughs> and that place seemed, seemed like it was Birmingham in the in the mid nineteen sixties. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I think that that bringing up Minneapolis and in general the BLM riots, the George Floyd riots, whatever you want to call them, I think that that's an apt comparison um, because what you have is an irrational wanton destruction of well their own communities. In this case, it's kind of crazy. But their own communities, but this this widespread rampaging. Now it didn't result in in many direct murders. It didn't result in people uh, being raped or tortured or anything like that. But it it's a similar kind of frenzy that breaks out there. You know that you see happening in those. Well, and then partly is because the stores were still full of stuff. Uh, so rather than going after each other. You go after the goods, you know, you, you just simply uh, loot and pillage. Uh, but once the goods are gone and, you know, we see the businesses are fleeing those neighborhoods, um, we could, we, I think, anticipate something else. Yeah, this is not a terribly positive episode, but I think we, <laughs> I think we really need to be thinking about these things. Um, yeah. Well, I think one of the uh, one of the things I remember from teaching courses on just war and just you know in in some of its developments is you had a lot of emphasis put on a kind of next step or what should be seen as a prior step called sort of the just peacemaking tradition. Now, this wasn't pacifists merely. This was just saying that there are some things 
especially in regions that have been divided and torn, that we can be about to help work towards ending the conflict. And I remember, you know, you saw episodes of this, especially in in Africa, work out in the long run. Um, But one of the problems is you have to have willing partners. (laughs) Um, And usually Mm -hmm. there's a lot of, of pain and generational pain that wants this to stop that becomes the only kind of natural condition of a readiness, you know, for people to, to want to embrace that. Um, the upside of that work is they do, they do not just focus merely on people's readiness, but trying to work towards creating the best conditions for people. But in places like this, it, it's just hard to imagine those kind of things being able to be very effective. And usually the kind of peacekeeping groups end, to be, end up being very left-leaning, and then they end up taking usually the wrong side in almost all of these all of these situations. So I think there is some noble um, Christian contribution going on in in just peacemaking theories and and trying to find practice for them. But I do think they're radically limited. And sadly, um, places like what's going on now, they just have had very little impact. Yeah, one of the things that comes to mind is Rwanda. Uh, One of the places comes to mind. And obviously there was a horrific genocide there. But my understanding is the situation there is very different at the moment and maybe even uh, better off than many parts of West Africa. Um, I guess, uh, you know, again, I'm I'm operating just on hearsay and little bits of news I've kicked up here and there. But my understanding is there's been a very strong leader there that helped to sort of move the things in a, in a positive direction. And, and I guess, mm-hmm. I guess that's what I want to get at is the role of leadership in this. Um, I know our democratic impulse is to just set up a committee, uh, just have a bunch of mm-hmm. votes, you know, trust a legislature to, to take you out of that kind of thing. I wonder though, if this isn't the sort of th- thing that re- really calls for, um, you know, world-class leadership and integrity and statesmanship and, and skill uh, in order to make it work. That's the specter right there. Um, the problem is we seem to be notably short on statesmen at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. Yeah, um, and and then we tend the, to yeah, throw money we, at it or the, we just have someone come in and use mere, mere – power and force um, and threat, um, Mm -hmm. but doesn't really, it it just puts it, it kicks it down the road. Yeah. With with all due respect to the current administration, um, they they are held pretty much in contempt across the Middle East. And that is demonstrated by the fact that that on Biden's trip to Israel, he had planned to meet with a number of, of key Middle Eastern leaders. And they all said, Nah, we got other things to do. <laughs> you don't do that to the president of the United States. Well, I guess I mean, you do it to the- in a normal world that would never have happened. Well, I, I think you do it with this one, but yeah, uh, that's the problem. What, what, but what, but this is another thing where I think uh, the American intelligentsia is out of touch with sentiments, not just in our own country but around the world. Um, the read, you know. The man who should not, should not be named, whose last name begins with T, <laughs> is actually fairly well regarded in many parts of the world outside the West. Um, mm-hmm. You know, respected, cheered, uh, admired, <laughs> that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he was but, well. He wasn't know, like someone said, cashing you know, in on on wars. <laughs> yeah, what, what, whatever the you know the the political side of this, you're right. What we need is strong leadership. And actually, we need strong leadership from America. And that's exactly the thing that's missing right now is really the point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, have a, so. I have a quick qu- quick question because I don't, I don't know enough of the history there. But the relationship of Afghanistan to Iran, um, are, they, are they in healthy conversation? Because we left an astronomical amount of weaponry in, in that region um, that – once it became, once they knew how to work, it could be very destructive for everyone around, much less, you know, much wider than anyone yeah. around. Um, any okay. word on yeah. what happened to that material and and how it fits into the possibility of more instigation? 
Yeah, there are rumors that some of it is starting to show up in other parts of the world, but I don't know that those have really been confirmed. Um, the Taliban's relationship with Iran, probably my guess is it's not good because the Taliban yeah. are Sunni and they yeah, are rabid right. Sunnis. And so they're yeah, unlikely right. yeah. to, uh, to snuggle up to, to Shia Iran. So I don't, I don't yeah. think they're probably on that good terms. But on the other hand, uh, there's the old proverb from that part of the world, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And if they both view yeah, the U.S. Not. as their enemy, they might agree to work together. Well, this gets into something that I think is worth considering a little bit. Um, one of the reasons why um, Israel as a nation state, and I'm not saying this is the only reason, but one of the reasons why uh, it's not conceived of as being legitimate is, is the House of Islam. The notion mm -hmm. that you have a uh, ostensibly uh, unified territory that is all subject to, well, Allah, Islam, uh, and that this is an incursion. Uh, you know, they, there's there may be some parroting of secularist uh, pieties in order to make Western people happy, but uh, the sense I have is that those are just superficial and really uh, the the actual story is something much more. Uh, medieval. Um, mm. Yeah, the, the idea within Islam, in, in conservative Islam, is that once a, a territory uh, becomes Muslim, uh, it should stay Muslim forever. And therefore, um, Israel's got to disappear. And by the way, also Spain. Right. right. You know, you'll, you'll, you, get, you get a lot of, um, uh, of the more radical Muslims who refer to Spain as Al-Andalus, which is its medieval name mm. under the... Uh, uh, under the uh, the caliphate, well, so sort of under but, the caliphate. It's a little more complicated than that. But but, get, but getting back to the the thought that uh, in the West we're more or less uh, tone deaf to this kind of stuff, uh, and all you need to do to play a Western leader is just, like I said, parrot the liberal pieties, and you know you yeah. you're, you're seen as a good guy. But uh, there seems to be two levels of sort of of a political uh, act activity at any given time anywhere in the world, but especially in this part of the world. <laughs> There's what's said and then what's really uh, kind of the sort of the passionate core of what's going on. And it strikes me that that's something that uh, definitely uh, leftist elites uh, at uh, Ivy League schools are not at all, uh, you know, hmm. thinking about. Yeah, because they don't understand religion fundamentally. We sort of we used to actually it wasn't that long ago when religion was studied in schools, just so you'd understand different yeah. belief systems and things like that. That's been systematically stripped out because religion is not considered to be a significant issue, mm -hmm. except Christians oppressing non Christians. Yeah, or when you have uh, you know a group that you can say belongs to this left wing coalition of oppressed groups. Now, now Islam is wonderful, you know, in spite of everything that you can actually document about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and, um, they're, and they're committed to, you know, to use a old theological uh, way of putting it, they're ontologies of violence, um, that the, at the heart of reality for them is power. And if they don't have it, they get to exercise power by any means necessary to achieve it because it belongs rightfully to them. And uh, when you when you have that notion of things, there there really isn't a way of assuaging it other than all or nothing tactic. Yeah. yeah. Now, you're related to that, Tom. Uh, you know, we've talked about this many times, kind of the nominalist volunteerist sort of framework, which really uh, found its way into the West from Islam uh, up Absolutely. through Spain yeah. and so forth. So yeah. this is this what we're dealing with. Uh, from that part of the world is plaguing our own society in kind of reworked yeah. f forms. But I, I, th I guess the yeah. thing is, is, so so we have an ontology uh, in the West historically that uh, is able to affirm the gift uh, character of creation, able to sort of sort of live with the the the, the fact that 
that you know some pretty fundamental realities have been set in place by God Himself. But at the same time, there's there's a great deal of freedom that we have. Uh, secondary causation is is real and not an illusion, as uh, you know the most conservative war, you know wing of his, Islamist theology maintains. And then uh, because of that, you know we're able to see uh, genuine. Uh, kind of rule of law, genuine, um, you know, democratic uh, sort of government uh, in action. But we're up against an enemy, uh, both internally and externally, that uh, doesn't play by those rules. And, and, and that's the challenge. You know, how do you, at the at one and the same time, hold on to your principles? while dealing with an enemy that cheats just all the time. And I'm talking about, you know, the radical left of the United States, but beyond the United States, you know, uh, you know, in Islamism, for example. Yeah. Well, that, that ultimately is the question that I want to ask critics of Israel's um, defense policy. What is the alternative? Right. What, what would you have them do? Give me something tactically or strategically that they can do to end the threats to their own civilians from Hamas. Just, just tell me what it is. Hamas uh, is famous for uh, hiding their, um, you know, setting military bases in mosques and hospitals and schools. Um, so that when you hit them, you've got civilian casualties. They, they use human shields all the time. They don't call them that, but that's fundamentally what it is. Um, what, so what, what would you have Israel do? By international law, it's actually legitimate for them to hit those military targets. Um, I don't know anybody who says that you're required to supply your enemy with, with um, uh, power and water, and yet somehow Israel is expected to do this. I mean, there are all kinds of, of, of oddities that seem to apply in this, this particular case. You're, you're dealing, yes, with asymmetrical warfare, but you're dealing with something that's the equivalent of 15 9-11s here, you know, in terms of the percentage yeah. of the population. I mean, what, yeah. what are they supposed to do? And unlike, um, you, know, you know, our own situation in the United States, um, where, you know, we have maybe ethnic minorities with grievances against the majority population. Here we've got a vast numerical majority surrounding Israel and a fifth man on the inside, which is uh, a large group of people who are aligned with those external enemies. Um, so uh, yeah. the kinds of things that people want to say uh, are uh, at least roughly parallel are, are actually not. By the way, we've gotten to the point where we should probably wrap things up. Is there anything you want to <laughs> end on? Uh, any note you want to end on, uh, Glenn? Um, no, I think we've covered everything I had in mind. Okay. How about you, Tom? Anything you want to <laughs> say as we wrap up? No, this was very informative for me. I, I've known, you know, broad brushes of the history of it, but it was good to kind of kind of know a bit more of the background on it. I think it helps very much so in, in at least making sense of what's going on. And uh, I, I already know, I, I, I can already make sense of the extreme uh, – the extreme voices that are always against anything Israel does. Um, but I didn't know so all, okay. all the details of that history. Yeah, yeah actually, let me, let me throw one more word in. <laughs> one of the reasons I brought this up is it isn't just about Israel. It's, right. it's, about, it's about the critical theory hard left in America. Right. BLM talks about decolonization and praises what Hamas did as decolonization. Mm -hmm. You know, the, these are things that we should be paying attention to and not just dismiss them as hyperbole or, or political rhetoric or something like that. We need to be paying attention to this stuff. So I would, I would, that, that I suppose is, is sort of the punchline. If I wanted to add something, that would be it. Yeah. I guess one last thought for me, just real quick, is at some point it'd be great to do a show on uh, some of the, the the divisions within Islam, uh, and in particular, kind of the, the Persian uh, Shiite Arab Sunni divide. I think that that's something that predates 
Islam. <laughs> so you know you, you've got you've got these uh, fundamental uh, sort of divisions in that part of the world, and as outsiders, we don't really have much insight into what you know. It'd be like you know if you look at uh, say uh, the United Kingdom from the standpoint of say somebody from Saudi Arabia, and you have no clue why the Scots and the English and you know the Irish have had, <laughs> and the Welsh have had such a hard time getting along for so long. <laughs> anyway, uh, why, why don't we wrap it up with that? Uh, thank you for listening to the Theology Podcast, and we do appreciate uh, your support. And uh, it's time to talk a little bit about Patreon, just briefly. Uh, thank you, new people who've joined our. Uh, Patreon account. Uh, we hope that you uh, are finding it uh, beneficial to get, you know, an early release on the shows, uh, to be able to ask us questions. I wish we were better at interacting with Patreon, but we try. We try, and every once in a while, my son uh, twists our arms and gets us in there and uh, in, in, interacting with folks. But uh, we've got some things in development, uh, new merchandise and so forth that we are, we're looking forward to see. Uh, you know, on the, on the merch store uh, at some point. Uh, we need to get the merch store up and running. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there are things in the works. And if you'd like to join uh, our Patreon account, we'd, we would like you to, to know that it, that's appreciated uh, because there are costs associated with the, sh with the show and Patreon goes a long way toward paying the bills. Anyway, that's enough for now. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The Theology Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. If you like this podcast, you might enjoy another one of our podcasts, Got a Minute, featuring Larson Hicks and Rich Lusk. Theology, philosophy, economics, politics, and more for normal people.